Today on The Terrible Warriors, we meet the makers. When Tristan Zimmerman told me he was designing an RPG about sailing out into the ocean blue to capture rogue sea shanties and return them to shore, I had to learn more. In the next hour, you'll learn all about how this game came to be and when you'll be able to play it yourself. We also chat about his twice any nominated blog, Molten Sulphur, including how he chose that colorful name. But of course, this is Meet the Makers, and so I desire to know Tristan more. And what better way than to ask him what it is about tabletop gaming that hooked him in the first place? <laughs> well, first off, uh, major props to you for framing it that way. Uh, because if I have to hear one more designer explain, yeah, I was in high school and I tried Dungeons and Dragons, and it turns out Dungeons and Dragons was a lot of fun. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna tear my ears out, right? Because we all have exactly the same story. I, I guess the 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 question of why, right? Why did this this get its hooks into you is is a really interesting one. Obviously, you have have the escapism factor, but but for me, it was it was the creativity, right? That I realized real fast that this was a medium where you could tell the kinds of stories that you can't tell in any other medium, right? Because it's collaborative, because each of the players and the GM is all, everyone's bringing something else to the table. We're going to be telling a story that is different from a story that any one of us would be able to tell on our own. And because there's no limitations beyond the limitations of your imagination and the limitations imposed by rules and setting, which of course are constraints that only breed more creativity, you wind up producing these stories that, you know, even when it's just a bunch of high school kids playing third edition Dungeons and Dragons around their parents' uh, dining room table, you wind up with guys being like, oh my God, I just had a great idea. You know, I have wood shape over here and I'm going to do a thing to the side of the ship. And, and everybody's like, wow, okay. So first off, that's brilliant and super fun. And second, none of the rest of us would have, would have thought of that. And you just, when you're playing a role-playing game, you kind of have experience after experience after experience yeah. that is everybody else at the table saying, wow, I would have never done that. And so it's just, it's a truly unique art form and I love it. It's really been for me like lesson after lesson of, of how a group working together, brainstorming an idea can produce really novel solutions. It's interesting, like thinking of other forms of, of immersive storytelling, like an escape room. Def, I mean, I love doing escape rooms for the puzzles, but also for the stories. We've got some here in Toronto that are like really like like they're in a castle and everyone's acting and it's all period piece during like the bootlegging era. And but as players in it, I have no real say on the ending other than do I win or do I lose? I don't I can't change the puzzles, whereas in a lot of RPGs. Depending on how that plays out, the player has some leeway to manipulate where their story is, certainly at least their character arc. But uh, depending on the system, even the puzzles themselves and the world building, there's there's so much more interaction and agency to to involve yourself in the creation process that you don't get in other forms of storytelling where mm -hmm. it's just consuming and uh, with, uh, with, with, with TPR, TTRPGs, it's not, you're not just a consumer at the table. Now you're, you're not just here to eat the story. You're also here to, to serve something up on the table for everyone else to enjoy. And it just lives there in the center of the table between everybody. Yeah. Everyone is simultaneously creator and consumer, uh, like at, at the same time. Yeah. Um, and, and that's nuts. That's wild. What other kinds of storytelling can you do that in? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, improv, you could get that sure. right with, with, if you're, if you're part of the troupe and you're, and you're involved in that, but without the framework of the game and the rules, 
it becomes a, a different kind of performance. It becomes there's a formula to improv. There's a strategy to listening and feeding and returning and yes ending and 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 having that back and forth that the different ways the ways that these rules in in rpgs can all the different permutations of it this is why we have so many systems so many games and settings that allow you to tell uh, from a game creator point a story that you have in mind when you're making your game that also allows the player to to manipulate and consume and create inside of that but but offering this this skeleton that you don't have when it's just the empty void of improv or 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 uh, or, or just sitting around a campfire and, and inventing a story on the spot uh, i don't it's it's addictive i i i, uh, I, I similarly i i started D D in high school and it was fine it was a fun time with friends uh it was it was a cheap way to play games for for someone who, who didn't come from a a, a well-off family um where where something like magic or warhammer and stuff were just too expensive as a hobby uh, but I think it was in college, and then later when I was uh, when I met Terrible Warriors, uh, and I was working in radio, and I saw the potential for creation in play and collaboration and uh, that injection of 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 yourself into what you're playing that I didn't have in my early days of Dungeons and Dragons. It wasn't allowed for a player to do that. You were just told the challenge, and I think. You know, that's just that's high school D and D for you, where where your character's biggest f- moment of agency is describing how they attack an enemy because they succeed at the attack roll, and then everything else is just following the older players as they go through the dungeon. You just die, stand behind and hold all the gear, and then and then I think later on it was Monster Hearts, powered by Apocalypse Game, and a light switch went off, me going like, oh my god, these games can be anything. <laughs> They can, this can be so much more. Can be anything. There are no barriers anymore. And uh, so, tell me about uh, yourself, Trist. I know, you, like, we're, we're going to be talking about shanty hunters because that's there on the title card. We already know that. Uh, <laughs> but you did mention you've also got moltensulfur.com, a twice any nominated RPG blog. Yeah. Tell me about molten sulfur. Uh, what, uh, like, what's molten sulfur all about? So uh, the Molten Sulfur blog at moltensulfur.com mm-hmm. uh, is a, a weekly role-playing game blog um, for content from real history and folklore. Oh, cool. So every Tuesday, I put out a piece that is dis- that, that, that goes through a real piece of real history or real folklore or every once in a blue moon science or literature. Um, and... It's 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 always something interesting, right? Something worth learning about yeah. on its own so, sake. Something to inspire the brain process. And then I talk about here's how you can file the serial numbers off of this and drop it in your fictional campaign setting, the campaign that you're already running. Here's how you can use this, you know, weird court martial in the campaign you're already running. God damn, I wish I knew about Molten Sulfur when we were playing 7th C. This would have been good. Um, cuz uh yeah, that was that was a that was a game that I was running where I was constantly looking at 16th century European history and be like, <laughs> what can I file away and and, and mm-hmm. remove the the uh, the identifying marks and 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 use in this setting. That's great. And uh, uh and and you uh, you've been nominated twice now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, boy, and it it's it's really both times it was kind of a knock me down with a feather because, um, right, I'm just some guy. Yeah, I, I like I'm not some big name muckety muck. I'm just some dude. Uh, and then they said, hey, we think this is this is good enough to to stand with the other any nominees and just blew my mind, blew yeah. my mind. So I'm very, very grateful, very, very. Grateful. That's the right word. I am very grateful. I say this time and again with the Any Awards. Don't care about the people who win. Uh, the gold and the silvers are based on votes. It's a people choice award. It's based on the people that, for the most part, the Any Awards, with the exception of some really breakout hits, are voted uh, based on name recognition. So mm-hmm. you're constantly getting uh, Cthulhu and Chaosium and uh, Dungeons and & Dragons and Warhammer. Those are always going to win if they're on the nomination list because the voters recognize them and Mm -hmm. uh and but if you go to the nomination list because those are paced by the judges uh 
that's where the winners are, uh, is, is those five or six people that are nominated for that different category. And if you, if you go through that, you see so many good ideas that, that just get ignored when, when the voting comes up because uh, no one's heard of you. Sure. <laughs> That's just the nature like you don't of vote a, for a candidate yeah, you've never heard of. That would be weird. It's the it's 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 the nature of a People's Choice Award style of award system. That um, uh, my advice is always with the Ennies, just look through the nomination list, and they're all those are all winners. Whoever wins the gold and the silver, they just they get an applause. Great, good, you got a medal. But it was um, uh, you just did the best. Uh, campaign to lobby uh, support online in, in, in some cases. And then you get others that are like, they break out because they are truly phenomenal mm-hmm. choices where it's like, holy smokes, there was, a, a, you know, and then I'm really, really happy for them. But now in under, understanding what molten sulfur is, that makes shanty hunters make so much more sense to me. <laughs> I'd like, oh, I get it now. So uh, your pitch to me with shanty hunters was, coming out to recover sea shanties but you have to that the lyrics themselves are generating the content of your game this week and so you're 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 fighting the shanty <laughs> and and bringing that in now, i know i butchered the whole thing but that that was what stuck in my head here we are so yeah so tell me here like shanty hunters it's coming out later this year you got your kickstarter planned uh what is shanty hunters so Shanty Hunters is a tabletop role-playing game uh, where you collect magical sea shanties in the year 1880. Uh, so this is 1880. This is the tail end of the Age of Sail. Um, the, the, the Age of Sail is, is unambiguously coming to a close. And you play as characters who are unhealthily obsessed with preserving the art of the sea shanty. Um, real quick, a, a shanty, uh, is a maritime work song. Uh, it is a song that sailors sing together, uh, to keep their, their labors, uh, in sync. So like y'all haul on the rope, on the beats, things like that. Um, and it's, it's a unique art form. Uh, it is, it is a working art form. Uh, and I think they're really wonderful. Uh, so the, the, the characters, they go out to sea. And they hear a shanty they've never they've never heard before they've never documented before and they say oh we need to we need to document that one because uh, if no one documents it it will be lost when the age of sail ends and they they document it but then the shanty comes to life and that is the bulk of the session is the lyrics of the shanty begin occurring aboard so the you're, ship. You're pulled into the realm of this shanty, this this yeah. and it'll be different depending on the shanty, what kind of challenge that manifests as would Absolutely. depend on the song. So if you document a shanty uh about uh, uh a fire that's moving around the ship. Uh, well, guess what? There's probably going to be a fire that's moving around the ship and you have to deal with it because it is your fault, right? You're the one who documented it. You're the reason this is a problem. And if you don't deal with the problem you created, probably the ship is going to be lost with all hands and and that's on you, right? But maybe you don't, maybe you, the GM, don't necessarily want to treat the fire literally maybe you want to have it be metaphorical in the the shanty i'm referencing fire down below uh it is definitely metaphorical it is a metaphor for for lust for carnal urges oh so um, maybe we're doing the next generation's naked now where this the crew is just <laughs> go, quite possibly you know it's it's how the gm necessarily wants to interpret it yeah is, is how you recapitulate it but what's key is the players have the lyrics yeah. and my strong recommendation is uh sing, sing the song sing the song together you're around a table with your friends you got these great songs like sing it at the table but then you have the lyrics in front of you and those are your core clues to a certain extent if you're smart if you can can really look at the lyrics and you can figure out what's going to happen before it happens and take steps uh i just got like goosebumps I got goosebumps thinking of like a certain like a song that has like that final line of like one more pull till we get home. And you can say that as you succeed and you finish it off. And and then that that line in that shanty ends up being the 
solution that then yes. wraps it all up and the magic goes away and it all gets contained into the scroll and it's over and it's just like exactly uh, i have a really interesting not with shanties but my uh, uh i mentioned just before we started recording i was born in ireland my family still lives in ireland and when i would visit in the summers uh, my granddad who uh, he passed away last year but when we would meet for for birthdays and anniversaries and celebrations he would always be the one to lead the songs and it would just get to a point in the night where he would just sitting at the table he just starts singing and the room would just then at that point go quiet and we would listen the thing is as soon as he was done singing he would point to someone else in the room and now it's your turn to sing ah, and ah. you better have come prepared with a song and yeah. and if you didn't know well who are you and and one by one around the room, everyone starts singing a song. And sometimes they'd be pop songs and sometimes they'd be folk songs and sometimes they'd be those call and response songs. And they would move around and everyone would have something different. And as the night got longer and the drinks kept going, they'd get a little bit more dirty and that eventually the grandkids would have to be sent upstairs <laughs> to go to sleep. Uh, and, but uh, my granddad was the kind of person he would walk into like the hotel bar that we were staying at for our summer vacation, who starts singing in the bar. By the end of the night, every person in that room is his friend and they're all singing songs and they're all having a great time. And that was just the kind of thing that when I then here in Canada, there's a lot of, especially in the Maritimes with shanties, a lot of those shanties have that origin of those Irish songs. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and there's definitely a connection with that DNA so that I could get away when I went to go visit my granddad, I could just sing something from Great Big Sea and it would fit, it would sound right and, yeah. uh, and, and it would work. And, uh, and, and, and now with like the way sea shanties have kind of taken off online, there's still that bit of, of that, that history that, that for me, that nostalgic connection to, to, to my family's past that uh, is really, I, I like this idea of going out and finding these songs and bringing them home or, 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 or finding, like there's this, there's this chaos collective consciousness energy that they've manifested because of all these years at sea being sung that they've come alive now. Like it's, it's, I don't know, it's very interesting, but then also it's, it's the 1880s. So, I just had to double check. Sherlock Holmes was active in 1887. So that's the era. We're in that like Victorian, is it Victorian or Elizabethan? Technically it's Victorian. It's Victorian age. Uh, so we're getting into uh, beginnings of the industrial era. Uh, the, 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 the industrial era began in, in, yeah. in the early 1800s. And so we're, we're getting uh, steam, like certainly at least with trains and steam engines and uh, uh, life is 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 very rapidly changing for the entire mm -hmm. world, yeah. and uh, uh, <laughs> but you could, <laughs> if you wanted to get crossover, uh, like be sailing out, uh, getting a shanty for Watson back there. Like that's the era we're ah! in, and, yes. uh, and and having if you're if you're playing um, in in a setting in that era, if you're doing that kind of uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes era of 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 a world i just it just made me think but now how you that is what shanty hunters is but now how is shanty hunters you mentioned the gumshoe engine and this is the engine that you've settled on on how we're going to read these lyrics and investigate this song and resolve it the the challenge because I understand, depending on the shanty, like your game is going to be different every single time. Yes, and so it's it's hard to <laughs> to get into the, the 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 gritty of what that would be like. So, so why did you choose the gumshoe engine, and what is the gumshoe engine? Because I, I I've come across this before. I know it's uh, popular with uh, Trail of Cthulhu mm -hmm. and Fall of Delta Green and mm -hmm. and and settings like that. Uh, Dresden Files is that gumshoe? No. Dresden's is fate. It's fate. Okay, so uh, but, yeah, but you can forgive me for like there's some mental overlap with with, <laughs> with all that. But uh, so so I've I've heard of Gumshoe. Uh, Mutant Mutant City Blues was Gumshoe. That was one yeah. we actually uh, someone ran for that on us on uh, on Terrible Warriors in the past. So uh, I've heard this used, but I've never had the opportunity to actually play a Gumshoe game. It just sit in my bookshelf, um, <laughs> and it's always felt for me. Uh, we can get into it, but Gumshoe's felt daunting as a GM. Uh, so. Tell me, what, what is the Gumshoe engine and why did you choose it for Shanty Hunters? So Gumshoe uh, is a rule set written by Robin D. Laws that is a, a game system built from the ground up for investigative play. It really is, it, it, it really is an RPG 
engine that is intended to run a Sherlock Holmes game or a police procedural, a game where, where the characters are collecting clues and putting the clues together to solve a mystery. Yeah, it's not about the it's not about combat or dungeon crawling. It's about um, investigations. Yes. It's it, there is a mystery and there is an answer to this mystery, and and it's for the players to find. It. Not like other, I think of other mystery games uh, where the like Nibiru, there is no answer at the end of that game. The answer is found through the players' creations. Gumshoe, there, there's an answer. The answer is. The answer is obscured mm-hmm. from the player, but it is it is predetermined, and and it's their job to uncover and hopefully find the answer before yes. time runs out. So the central narrative insight that underlies all Gumshoe RPGs is the idea that failing to discover a clue is not interesting and rarely generates interesting. Uh, interesting stories, right? Sherlock Holmes doesn't walk into a room, see the cigarette ash, and yeah. and and then fail his know about cigarette ash, uh, cigarette ash check, and then story develops. Like, no, he he recognizes that's yeah. the point. The fun lies not in the tension of are we going to get the clues. The fun is in the tension of can we put them together. It's, 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 it's putting yes. the puzzle pieces together. So it's not about keeping it so that you don't have the corner piece on your puzzle. It's about mm-hmm. you have the pieces. Can you put them in the correct order? So it's like, yeah, playing Phoenix Wright. It's not going to be interesting if you can go and not find the clue and then you got to go back to court and you've missed something. Like there's no, that's not possible in a Phoenix Wright game. You will find all of the clues or you won't be allowed to progress back to the trial. It's about then looking at your inventory, looking at the clues you've collected and can you assemble them in a way that creates that logical solution where you go aha i've done it and then you have that real sense of smug satisfaction of i exactly. put it together um now sh- uh, shanty hunters uses a a very stripped down version of the gumshoe engine because gumshoe and i want to be clear i'm a big fan of gumshoe i think it is it is a masterpiece of game design uh, but it is a masterpiece of game design that was built for adventures at least three sessions long. Um, Gumshoe yeah. one shots are, are frequently unsatisfying just because it's not built for that, right? Like that's just not what it's here for. Shanty Hunters is a very episodic game because every adventure yeah. you're tackling a new shanty. There's relatively little carryover between the shanties. Uh, you can have some. Uh, that's maybe something we talk about later in the interview, but it might be carryover with the characters. Certainly carryover with that, the characters. Like you're you're part of the same research team and you're going out on another yes. thing. But it's 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 a uh, not to live. It's a monster of the yeah. week it's, 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 idea it's, where you're yeah exactly. And so I needed to to rework Gumshoe in order to make it fit in this highly episodic, very short, mm-hmm. very punchy, uh, very uh, uh, context. But the core of Gumshoe remains because ultimately Shanty Hunters is an investigation. The core clues yeah. are the lyrics, right? Like yeah. when it's time to sing the song, the, the GM hands out the song sheets. There may be other clues out there for you to uncover that will you know, really help you put the pieces together and figure out how you're going to handle these various weird events that are now recapitulating. But the bulk of your core clues are right there on the lyric sheet in front of you. And so I wanted to use Gumshoe because Gumshoe is built around the idea of, yeah, man, here are the core clues. Now do something about it. So with Gumshoe, I understand that, again, coming from someone who hasn't yet actually played Gumshoe, that there is a a lot more pressure than other systems on the GM to uh, plan in advance and prepare prepare their game. So you need to not just have the clues, you need to have the answers, you need to know where things are. You need need to have the bigger picture plotted. Uh, And especially in those bigger, like, uh, I think of Trail of Cthulhu games, you you really need to know your screenplay uh, of what's happening. And, and that's one reason that has prevented me from getting it. Cause I just don't have time for that. I, I really uh, gravitate towards those pickup and play styles. So with, with shanty hunters, you've got your lyrics, you've got your clues. Is it the, on the GM to generate how it manifests for the players or is it, or is there some world building for the play? Or are they just, are they just experiencing 
these these events being presented to them? So there's one primary way where the players uh, get to influence how the adventure is going to go, and that is in designing the villain. One shots in Shantanders, if, you know, we're not going to run a, a campaign, like we're just going to get together, we're going to play one game, and then we're going to move on with our lives. You don't necessarily need a villain, right? The shanty is villain enough. Um, but uh, I find that Shanty Hunters really uh, is is at its most fun. And it's, it is, in my humble opinion, an enormous amount of fun in one shots, but it is even more fun in short campaigns, campaigns of perhaps seven sessions. And in those campaigns, you're really going to want to have a villain to provide kind of a through line. And the villain is the wicked spirit that causes the shanties to recapitulate. So uh, maybe your villain is, is uh, you know, Davy Jones, and Davy Jones doesn't like it when shanties fall into the hands of landsmen because he feels that shanties are his prerogative and he's very possessive of them. And so he's going to yeah, get Or like you. a Tia Dolma thing from, from Pirates of the Caribbean, just the sea itself manifesting right. as this, this force. Uh, and so he's going to get you by making yeah. the shanties recapitulate. But the game, the, the, the book, and I have the, the printer's proof here, the game includes seven example villains and talks about how the campaign you run will be very different depending on what sort of villain you you wind up having. So for example, I have a sample villain, the fiddler, who's 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 awful. Like she is she is a, a horror movie type villain. And if everybody's like, we want to run, you know, we want this to be horrible, we want this to be scary then your villain will interpret the shanties in a particularly horror-inspired way. And I strongly recommend, during your session zero, at the, the start of your, your short little campaign, getting input from all the players. Hey, guys, what do you want this campaign to look like? What sort of obstacles do you want it to have? What sort of themes do you want it to embody? And then you design a villain or pick one of the seven sample villains that fits those themes. So maybe you want to have something that's really where, where the real villain is colonialism, right? Well, cool. I present Britannia, the, 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 the embodiment of, of the United Kingdom as a sample villain. And cool like you can now run with that and if if it, that is that is the primary way that players get to have agency over what the adventures look like and that's a really great opportunity uh, for the gm now as you're inviting suggestions on how to build this villain you can also that's an opportunity to gently casually introduce something like lines and veils and to talk about your safety mechanics and you know as you're talking about this villain someone might mention hey let's make a villain about colonialism and someone at the table's going like maybe not uh, <laughs> because that sounds really um uh something i don't want to experience in this game today because it's a little too close yeah. to real life right now um can we do something more supernatural something more davy mm -hmm. jones or just the grim reaper or uh, uh the sea itself cthulhu mm -hmm. can we just do that instead and uh and then it brings up an idea okay so now we can talk about our themes because some of these shanties you know are interesting to sing and are lovely and they sound great and there's good history but there also isn't a good history to these songs and to this era and to these uh, to, to where these songs come from. And that is an opportunity to have space before you play to consent to these these shanties as well, to, to know, like, you know, is this a shanty that took place during an era when uh, they were shipping people, not just cargo, uh, uh, and, and, and singing songs up on the deck? So uh, to... to recognize that as well right and 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 uh, like any game you're running uh you have to consider your safety tools and I, I like if you have a moment to plan out who your villain is that's also your moment to talk about people's boundaries and and and, and their comfort levels and and that is something that i talk about real explicitly in the book, right? Like, here's what lines and veils are. Here's why they're a great idea. This is a great time to talk about them. Uh, you know, the, this game is a, you know, here's all the ways that I have identified anyway, that this game is problematic. And here's what you, sh what you might want, how you might want to handle that at the table. And yeah, like, 
the, one of the things that the, the game tries to do is, is present how to run a good session zero specifically for this game. And there's nothing, uh, reading it too, I, you don't have to be an apologist for shanties. You don't have to defend them either. Your characters, as it sounds like, are researchers, anthropologists, characters that are trying to recover history. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't have to be good history. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be the reason to rescue and save it because it needs to be glorified and turned into a statue, but because it needs to be taken away from the seas and put in into a museum so we, it can be it can be learned in the proper context. And so there's there are conversations that you should have with your table before for playing any period Absolutely. piece. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so I, I, I like I like any game that gives space for meta talk before you play uh, is really important. Uh, just I, I found recording here on Terrible Warriors, our best episodes came to before we hit record, before we started playing, going like, what do you want to do in this hour? I know I'm running the game, but you're the player, you're a participant. What do you actually want to do? Like, if you don't want to do the thing I'm planning, I, I don't want to yeah. run it. So so let's talk about, like, what what are your goals for the next, you know, two, three, four hours? And... Uh, how can I be able to help um, pave the road in that direction so that we can we can all play the game we want to be playing? And that's not going to spoil your game. No, the opposite. <laughs> that's not a spoiler to tell, like, I am planning on betraying the group today. And I don't know exactly when or how or what, but but you do... We've had that happen on our show where someone does double cross surprisingly and it really hurts another player at the table because that you know I, and you do it's not a spoiler alert to let someone know what you're planning to do in your game especially when it involves the choices and the agencies of the other players on the table and the experience that they're going to be having because you're not just telling a story you're telling a story with yeah other people that are telling a story. So, uh, yeah, when it, 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 it's come up in the last year a few times now about meta talk and table talk, and um, I've, I've completely turned my opinion around on that. And I just like, it, table talk is fine. It's great. It should be encouraged and invited. Uh, and it really does make your games interesting and make your stories pop. Talking about Shanty Hunters and the Gumshoe Engine, it makes sense with Molten Sulfur, and, uh, and, and you've, you've got a love of history. And, and, and a love of, 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 uh, of, of where these things come from, but you've, you've also got a love of the sea as well. You, you, the Shanty Hunters is not just picked because of the songs. It's picked because of the ships, too, isn't it? Uh, you, want it you, want it to, you want it to bring two worlds together here with your gaming love and, 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 your, and your love of sailing. Um, have, have you, you've spent time at sea, right? Yeah, so I uh, I come from a sailing family. I was first taken to sea before my first birthday. Uh, you know, there was there was little baby Tristan swaddled up in a basket uh, in <laughs> in the cockpit of a sailboat. Um, and uh, so you know, I with 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 my family, I, I sailed to to Cuba. I sailed to the Dry Tortugas, um, and then after college, uh, I joined the Navy. And uh, with the Navy, uh, I circumnavigated the globe. Uh, I crossed the equator, famously the the crossing the line ceremony. I, I crossed the equator uh, off the coast of Somalia. I've never heard of that. Oh yeah, it's it's a uh, there's a cer- there's a ceremony when you cross the yeah, equator. Yeah, it's a fabulous bit of of old timey maritime lore, superstition, whatever you want to call it, um, where. Uh, sailors who have not crossed the equator at sea uh, are called polywogs. Um, oh. And sailors who have are... That's a Pokemon. Uh, like the Pokemon. <laughs> uh, sailors who have are <laughs> called old. shellbacks. And when you cross the equator for the first time, there's this whole rigmarole where uh, some of the ship's senior officers dress up as members of King Neptune's court and King Neptune expresses outrage. And like King Neptune like has a mop for a beard, right? 
uh, and King Neptune expresses outrage that there's all these dirty, stinking polywogs permitted aboard his briny in in his briny realm, and how dare uh, how how dare this ship intrude in this way? Um, and so then th- then it's hazing, right? Like let's call a spade a spade. Then yeah. it's hazing. Um, though in in recent years, at least in the Navy, the the hazing portion has been toned down, and the fun portion has been it's turned into more pomp and circumstance, yeah. a bit of cosplay and theater. Yeah, and um, and and then at the end, you you get a, a baptism in seawater, uh, and and King Neptune says, you know, you have now been baptized. You are a trusty shellback. You are now authorized to 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 sail my briny realm. That's so weird. It's, it's 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 a very particular thing, uh, yeah. and of course, it's all secret, right? Like I, you are now entrusted with the secrets. So you know, ooh, I can't tell. Yeah, you Yeah, I feel what like really you've just happened. told me about what happens at OT eight in Scientology. Like you just, <laughs> you've really just blew the lid off of naval traditions here. But uh, uh, that's but wild. Yeah, there's this whole like sequence of 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 things you have to do. It's it's an enormous amount of fun. It's it's endless fun. That's great. I, I my, my imagination was going like, gosh, because Star Trek is all about like aping naval traditions in space. What would the equator version in Star Trek <laughs> be that someone passes by, maybe leaving the solar system for the first time or something, and and then they all have this big elaborate holodeck ceremony for them. You have and, to be oh, baptized got, my, my in going. the vacuum of space. <laughs> We just shoot you out one door and into the other. <laughs> 30 seconds, you can survive. You'll be fine. You'll just be a little depressurized. <laughs> I've watched The Expanse. I saw how it works. <laughs> oh, so, geez. Okay, so, cool. Yeah, I've, so, I've definitely, like, I have spent more than my fair share of time at sea uh, and the sea. So when you're playing Theater of the Mind and you're on a boat, you, you know what yeah. you're doing here. Yeah. Like, you, you know the parts. You know the the terminology. Uh, and uh, so, so that... It, it it did appear looking at the, the 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 documents you sent me for Shandy Hunters that this isn't uh like uh like Sea of Thieves. Uh, I love Sea of Thieves. This is this is taking a bit more of a realism touch to that of of having an opportunity if you mm-hmm. want to to get into the nuts and bolts of uh being on a ship and 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 learning the 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 technical know how of that and and using that to help understand a lot of the terms that are used in the sea shanties, which will mention parts of sure. ships and, 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 and things like polywog, you can imagine where I might not know what these words mean uh, because these are using terms that are very particular mm-hmm. to a particular uh, culture and, and, and history and, and, and a job <laughs> and, and a ship. So what was it like now working that in, into shanty hunters and how how I guess how are you helping to convey this knowledge into the game for for land lovers like myself? So you got to be careful as as a designer, right? Because you have players for whom it is incredibly important that all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed. That you know uh, a, a brig and a barkentine, like that that there be meaningful distinctions, and that you know the 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 forecastle and the forecastle head be clearly differentiated. You also have lots of players who are like, look, man, that is a lot of moon language, and I don't know any of it. And frankly, I don't care to know any of it because I'm just here to play a fun game with my friends and sing these cool songs. And you know what? Both approaches are a hundred percent valid and every approach in between. So what I had to do was I had to, first off, I had to make sure all my eyes were dotted and my T's were crossed. And I had to present all this information so that it is there if you want it. If you want to get into the nitty gritty, if you want to make sure that you're, you're doing everything right in scare quotes, that, that you have the opportunity and that I'm providing you the tools that you need. But on the other hand, None of it is necessary, right? None of it is needed. In in the 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 book has uh, I want to say fifteen shanties in the back of it that are all historical and that I picked because they make particularly good adventures. And all of those shanties have footnotes. So if the shanty mentions, you know, that 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 the the the, 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 ca- the the captain stands on the quarter deck, like yeah, man, go go down to the footnote. It tells you what a quarter deck is. You're good to go. And then a huge amount of it just comes down to knowing your groups. And so when, uh, you know, when I run one shots of shanty hunters at, at cons or what have you, uh, a lot of it is just getting a feel for the group and their level of, of comfort and, and how much they want this and then meeting their expectations. Um, and 
I worked really hard to, to try to make sure that the book lets you, the GM, do that exact same thing and meet your players, not necessarily where they're at, but where they want to be. Yeah, I, I came across something that uh, in Worldwide Wrestling, the mm-hmm. role playing game, um, not a fan of pro wrestling myself, but I ran it with pro wrestlers. <laughs> and uh, and the game included diagrams of moves with the names and 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 pictures of of that move being done, uh, explaining uh, essays in the book of what the history of wrestling was and how it is today and how the organizational structure works between like what's on TV versus what's being played in your local church basement and. Uh, uh, and it, it gave me that primer to be able to, even without being a, a, a big fan myself, still feel like I could operate in this world. And and it does sound like Shanty Hunters has similar assists yes. to aid you. And and if you if you want, you can you can always look it up on Wiki as well. Like to get a cross section of the ship with all the this is aft, this is bow. <laughs> Don't forget port is on the left side, uh, depending where you're standing. But you know, what I mean, like it's uh, uh, know, knowing knowing the parts if you if you if you want to get into it because it can be fun, especially when we're dealing with a mystery and clues to, <laughs> to drop a word no one necessarily knows at the table and then have them figure out what that word is. Flip through. Oh, it's. It's actually, it's the wheel. They're, talk, they're just talking about the wheel. <laughs> we got to get over there now. <laughs> and um, and in fact, the the sample adventure in the, the back of the book, and of course the book has a sample adventure and pre-generated characters, like I want you to be able to play this just right out of the box. Um, yeah. The sample adventure has ju- precisely that conceit where there is a word in the shanty um, where... I don't, I, me personally, I don't know what the word is. And I did my research and I did my homework and nobody knows what that word means, right? Like the meaning of that word. Oh, it's just been lost to time. It's been lost. It's just a dead and word. Cool. So it's just like, cool, guess what? That means I get to make it up. And so I like part, one of the things that that happens in uh, in the sample adventure at the back of the book is figuring out what the heck this word is. And of course, then you have, clues and a variety of ways that you can uncover, you know, what that, that word truly means and then use it to solve the real big yeah. pressing concern that's threatening the ship. But yeah, right. Like that's just baked into the book right there. We've got about 20 minutes here before I'm going to kick okay. you off the ship and have you swim back <laughs> home. I'm curious to work through, we've been talking a lot about, okay, you take your shanty, you've got your gumshoe engine, you're making these clues, you're, you're, you're trying to solve it. What would what is that prep process like here? Uh, so I I'm, I haven't I, I got I got the game. I'm gonna have my players. They're, they're gonna come over on Saturday. We're gonna play this. Uh, I'm looking through my list of shanties. I've also got some shanties that uh, I I've, I've heard from the Longest yep. Johns and I'm big fans of and, and and I'd like to maybe adapt into this game. Uh, one in particular about the Halifax Harbor explosion that feels good Ooh. Canadiana. So let's go and do that. Yeah, it's called Fire and Bone or something like that. And. Um, uh, so that's going to end well. Uh, you've, you've basically got to solve it before the ship explodes mm-hmm. and takes out everything around you. Um, <laughs> so as that's going on, uh, it actually would be fun because in that particular story, everyone was crying for help in Halifax as they ran from the ship up the road, but no one understood the sailors because they only spoke French. Oh, no. And Halifax was an English port. And so they were running, run for your lives, run for your lives. It's going to explode. It's going to kill you all. And all they heard was sacre bleu. And they didn't know what they were talking. They didn't understand what they were saying. So everyone just kind of stood there and watched. And so I can only imagine if you're playing Enchanting Hunters, there is people crying for help at you, but they're all in French. Mm Mm-hmm. Who in the room speaks French because you don't understand it? You can't understand what they're saying, and if you don't understand what they're going to say, you're not going to survive this. And it's uh, so anyway. So it was, it was a good, it's a good, it's a good shanty. So I've got this. What is that preparation process like? How do you take the shanty now and 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 uh, uh, very like I'm just talking like Cole's notes 101 as you're you're at a convention, you're giving the GM some tips on like how how do they go about the prep the the process of now uh, dissecting this, this, these lyrics and deciding what's a clue, what's part of the song, what's part of the solution. Um, how, how does how does that? Because it just seems like magic right now. <laughs> and 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 I'd love to just know a little, like, kind of just a little bit of what to expect when I'm when I'm planning my game out. Because I do, I love the concept of, you know, this game would 
change in tone as well, depending on what shanty you you settle on. And so, um, what's uh, how, how did you go about that? Because it was so many different shanties. Is it? it are you going to come across songs that are just not going to work in the game? So, um, all of the shanties that are in the book should work just fine, but. In, in the, the the wider world, yeah, you will absolutely come across shanties that won't work um, because nothing happens in them, right? <laughs> like the shanty is going to recapitulate, but if your shanty is just sort of like haul on the rope, boy, here we are hauling on the rope. And there's a lot of shanties and a lot of them are very musical. It's just row, row, row your boat. Yeah. Then, then okay, I probably shouldn't drop that. So, so your first step legitimately is figure out which shanty you want to use. Grab one from the book, grab one uh, from the longest Johns, um, you know, the grab one from, uh, grab one from the Dreadnoughts, uh, grab one from Stan Rogers, you know, Stan Rogers, uh, Jesus, grab the Mary Ellen Carter or Northwest Passage or something. So step one, grab, grab your shanty. And then step two is just go over the lyrics with a fine tooth comb. Um, I promise you, things will jump out at you. Right. And things will jump out and you'll be like, that's really cool. Let me just highlight that. Let me just highlight that on my page here. And some of these things will jump out at you as like, okay, that strikes me as a problem. And this one, like that strikes me as a solution. Maybe I need to create a problem that this, this line can be a solution to. And like you were, you're just going to have to take my word for it. I promise you, as you read through the lyrics and treat them as, as text, rather than as, as music, cool bits of imagery, cool events, things that excite you will simply leap off the page and grab those and then turn them into obstacles, turn them into puzzles, turn them into problems, turn them into enemies, turn them into solutions. Um, enemies, probably not that you have to fight because this is not a game about fighting and buckling swashes. Um, but enemies to outwit, enemies to sneak past. And uh, one one thing that I, I strongly recommend doing, uh, turn some not just into obstacles, turn some into complications. Um, so when I say complications, what I mean is things that take a straight outside situations that take a straightforward obstacle and suddenly render it a lot more complicated. So to continue with the fire down below example, if there is a fire in the hold. Well, guess what? Ships carry all kinds of firefighting equipment, right? So you can just rig up the pumps. Ships are lousy with pumps for pumping out the bilge. Connect some hoses to it and spray down the fire. Well, that's not very interesting, right? That's not a fun obstacle. Cool. Here's a, a, here's a complication. The cargo is silk. And so if you spray down the hold, you will ruin the cargo. And that is bad news bears. So you can't do that. And all of a sudden, because you have these restrictions, now you have to get creative. Now you have to get interesting. And maybe the fire is intelligent. Maybe it is a magical fire that's, you know, running around. Maybe uh, it is a metaphor for something. We talked about the, the metaphor earlier. And you have to incorporate the metaphor into your solution. In but Sea of Thieves, when you got fire, sometimes you're in the... Uh a devil's roar, the water itself is boiling around oh, your dear. ship. So you can't just bilge the water and pump the fire out because then you're just hitting everyone with scalding hot ah. boiling water because all the water around you is 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 boiling around. So it it, it makes fire suppression a little bit more interesting. <laughs> and that's a terrific example, right? Like and and all of the fun things that happen don't necessarily have to be tied to the shanty. Um they can also be tied to the nature of the villain, right? There's another force at work here. Yeah. There is another force at work here. And so the, the book presents uh, a, a plethora of examples of complications, of obstacles, of things to, to pull out of the shanties. But then, and this is, I would argue, the most important part, you have to set up the establishing incidents. Um, I do not recommend setting up obstacles with, you know, one solution in mind. This is the only way you can uh, uh, overcome this obstacle. Because then what, what does the game turn into? It turns into uh, the players playing, guess what the GM is thinking. Guess how the GM interpreted this line. That's terrible. Yeah. That's not any fun yeah. at all. Uh, I find it, it's a pet peeve of mine when I play a game um, and something happens, didn't notice it later on 
villain comes in, wipes out most of the team. They go, well, three hours ago I mentioned this and you weren't paying attention to the lore or you didn't read the book and you didn't know the history of Ravenloft. And uh, and if, you, if you'd read it, you would have known that that's how this works here. And then you would. I was like, that's a cheap shot at playing exactly. on the player's ignorance. And that's, that's terrible. And my character might is you know, I, 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 my character is better at this than I am. And my character is the professional, not me. So my character needs to be able to be equipped with knowledge that the player might not have and would recognize something in the room that Justin would never notice or understand. But uh, understanding that my character is, is, is a professional in this world yes. and is, is, is good at what they do. So um, if there was something important about this world that they should know, it shouldn't be like, well, you I, I mentioned it was on the blankety blank and you should have just known to, to head over there and, and tack the sails or something. I was like, I don't, I, tack doesn't mean what I think it means. So, right. So yeah, 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 yeah. Don't, don't, don't pull the rug out of the player's ignorance and take cheap shots like that. Actually equip them so that when you defeat them, if it happens, it's done where it's like, ah, uh, it's done dark soul style. Ah, uh, you got me. I just didn't dodge in time. I, I you got me. <laughs> I, 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 I deserved that. Yeah. So, uh, so like rule one, and the, and the game strongly encourages this. If you have an obstacle and the players come up with a reasonable, clever solution, like doesn't matter whether that's the solution you anticipated. You you come up with a solution so that you are confident that the the obstacle can be overcome. That you're not yeah. throwing an impossible situation. It might not be your solution, but if it is a solution, be the fan of the players and give them the win. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and be like, well, you know, I uh, I needed it to fit into this circle uh, that that I created, and you made me a square. Well, the, a square can fit in a circle if it's a little bit smaller. Yeah. Like it can fit. It, like it's so yeah. then the final bit of the prep is preparing the establishing incidents. Because exactly like you said, the characters are professionals, but the players are not. And you have to assume that your players don't have this knowledge because it is weird, obscure, like sailing knowledge is not common knowledge. You cannot operate under the assumption that the players have any of it. So you have, it, once you have generated the obstacles you know what pieces of knowledge are going to be important in this session, right? If you know that the the the, the villain is going to cause the shanty to recapitulate in this way, that it is important to know how tacking works, you have to teach tacking to the players. And you do not want that to be, now we're going to give you a 15-minute lecture. Even if it's just like, snap the finger and do a flashback to back in port, you're three years old, your dad's showing you how to work the ship the first time. They go, don't forget the tacking, son. And then you come back to the present day. Like, oh, I just remembered this most important life lesson. Um, like, however you want to pull that off. Uh, I, I'm a fan of even pulling the camera away from the player's perspective. If there's something like there's a glowing red key that's down in the captain's quarters that you have to get to because it's shaking, pull the camera away and go... Meanwhile, in the captain's quarters, a glowing key is beginning to shake on the table yeah. and then bring it back to the players. And now the players might know a little bit more than the characters do, just like the audience does when we're watching a TV mm -hmm. show. And uh, and they can't get to the captain's quarters because there's all these other obstacles in the way, but at least they have a target on their back. They know something's happening. Yes. Don't be afraid to let the villain shifty eye and move around the corner and do something that the characters don't see but you let the players mm -hmm. recognize right uh I'll, I'll they're being spied upon by a raven with yellow eyes well i'll just let the camera go up and meanwhile unbeknownst to the characters a raven with yellow eyes is watching and flies off to tell its master <sighs> right it doesn't do anything to the character's agency but it gives everything to the players to be like Oh, we're being watched. Oh, we need to now take it seriously. It, it raises the stakes. Mm -hmm. So, like, it, it, it don't. It's, too often we try to think of it like it's a, a a locked third person camera in a video game. We can't pull away, but you are free to futz with yes. it. <laughs> so, the establishing incidents I recommend as being the opening one or two scenes in the adventure. Yeah. And their job is simply to present the information that it is important that the players have, right? Yeah. So if they need to know about tacking, then you're going to have a scene that involves tacking. And just start bringing out all the checkoff guns. Exactly. And it just is it lay is lay them on the table. This is just you laying the checkoff's guns on the table and giving the characters 
a reason to interact with them. Because once the character has interacted with the gun and said like, oh, this sure is a gun, interesting. It goes boom here and a bullet comes out there. Then the player will remember because the character yeah. has has interacted. And you just have to provide yeah. reasons for the characters to interact with the thing. And now the player has the knowledge and now they are fully equipped to come up, not just with the solution you designed, but with their own dang solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's how that's how you prep. It's pick your shanty, pick your obstacles, design your uh, your your establishing incident. Um, and I will concede that is perhaps more more prep work than than some GMs are comfortable for. You know, we increasingly live in an era of wonderfully low prep RPGs. <laughs> um, we really do. And like for a gumshoe game, Shanty Hunters is ludicrously low prep. Yeah, but. You know, it it you do actually have to take some time before the the session and sit down, and maybe it only takes you half an hour, but you do have to figure out here's how the shanty is going to recapitulate, here's what they better know about, and here's how I'm going to make sure they know it. And you know, uh, I, I've 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 planned a few campaigns in my time, <laughs> and it's uh it, it is very satisfying to have something worked out and then be able to bring it to the table and I, I guess it just the lesson here is like yeah don't use the player's ignorance as a, a weapon you can bludgeon over their Never. head like give them all the equipment they need to defeat you stack the odds in their favor and 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 give them those wins there, it's you don't want to go into an escape room that you can't feel you can't actually escape. Mm -hmm. You need to feel like you're down to the last 10 seconds. If only you had that last combination code from that book and you just have run out of time, but you know how it works now. It all makes sense. That that's, that's a good way to lose an escape room. And, and it does feel in a way that Chanty Hunters kind of plays a little bit like an escape room in a, in a way with, with that. Like we've got the clues, you've got the songs and we've got a time limit and like we're, playing in four hours and then we're going home and so and, and this does feel like you know at the end of the night if you haven't solved it you have you maybe you, you take the lose yeah. and uh the, the 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 shanty disappears and the villain gets the win this mm -hmm. week and uh and next week it'll be a different shanty you don't have to actually do uh follow-ups in that way um so it'll be I'm looking forward to seeing how this goes <laughs> how do we follow up with you and with Shanty Hunters and uh, and know what's going on. I understand you're planning the uh, Kickstarter uh, for the latter part of this year. Where should we go to stay up to date and to know what is happening with Shanty Hunters and with Tristan and with Molten Sulfur? So uh, the Kickstarter will go live on November 2nd. Uh, if you go to moltensulfur.com slash shanty dash hunters, uh, or hopefully that link will be in the show notes, fingers crossed. It will Excellent. be. It will be. I know you don't read them, but they're in the show notes. That will take you to uh, a page that talks about Shanty Hunters, explains what it is, what's in the book. Um, and there's places where you can enter your email address and just enter your email address on that page. And I will notify you when the Kickstarter goes live. And that is the only thing I will use your email address for. That does not sign you up for a weekly newsletter. It doesn't sign you up for future Kickstarters. Like that is purely for the Shanty Hunters Kickstarter. But if we did want to sign up for a weekly newsletter, and, and we really liked what you described about Molten Sulfur, and I might have you on later to actually talk about this Heck blog because yeah. it sounds really like a really cool tool. Uh, how can we follow up with you and with with the Molten Sulfur blog? Uh, or do you have do you have any social medias? Any uh, any place that we can follow up on? Uh, so you can uh, read the blog at moltensulfur.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at at Molten Sulfur. Uh, you can search for Molten Sulfur blog on Facebook. Uh, and if you go to moltensulfur.com, uh, there is a, uh, a space where it says, you know, sign up for the weekly, weekly, weekly notification that a post has gone live. And you can enter your email address in there. And I will shoot you an email every Tuesday to say, hey, there's a new post. Here's what it's about. Hope you enjoy it. Um, and that also, of course, will keep you up to date about what's going on on Shanty Hunters. If you just do a Google search for molten sulfur or Shanty Hunters or something like that, uh, it should all be pretty self-explanatory. Why molten sulfur? Why the name? Where did that name come from? Uh, Is that too long a question? Uh, no. So uh, <laughs> molten sulfur uh, is... So first off, uh, molten sulfur is a real thing that is very colorful, right? And like those are those are my two... The, the two like parts of my brand is it's real stuff 
and it's very colorful. Okay. Uh, and in particular, it's colorful because the melting point of sulfur is just below its flash point. So oh. in real life, when you have molten sulfur, it is almost always on fire and it burns blue. Sulfur burns bright blue. So like there are volcanoes in Indonesia that spew molten sulfur instead of lava. And you have these rivers of blue flame running down the volcano. That's and, wild. And it's 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 very colorful and it's very weird. Uh, it also smells terribly. So if you want to flip it on its head, it's like, oh, it's molten sulfur because it stinks. Uh, but, but then I will be hurt. So please don't say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Final bit here, Tristan, before I let you go, Shanty Hunters, you've had a chance to play it and, and, and see other people play it. Is there a particular, like, anything that caught you by surprise, a good story that happened in the game that just has really stuck with you that you didn't expect Shanty Hunters to produce? Something that you're kind of, I don't know, proud of? Anything emerged that, uh, that, 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 that came out of this game that was just like, oh, yeah, something to look forward to? What's, what's what, that kind of takeaway? The thing that really jumped out at me is how much people enjoy it, right? And it's it's a hugely self-selecting audience, right? That's one of the things about this game is if you see something that says shanty RPG, you're probably either going to say, man, that sounds like the biggest waste of my time I've ever heard, or you're gonna say, oh my God, I love shanties and I love RPGs. Like, give me the two great tastes that taste great together. So it's a self-selecting audience, right? But then when you take this the self-selecting audience and you get them at the table and people start playing, they have a blast. And that's just the most heartening thing in the world, particularly, and I'm sure this is something you can relate to as a podcaster, but as a blogger, it so often feels like you're just yelling into a void, right? You're putting content out there on the internet and you can check your analytics and you can see like, look, people are reading this, but you often nobody like then turns around to say like, hey, I really enjoyed that thing you wrote. Like, it's just, you're putting it out there into the world and that's it. Uh, so to, to sit at a gaming table and be with other people and these people are like, oh yeah, now we get to sing Drunken Sailor and they're all singing Drunken Sailor and they're having a great time and they're getting into it and they're they're really role playing their characters really hard and they're all of the weird, odd, special things about this game that you pour so much of, of your heart and your effort and yourself into and they're engaging with it and they're having a great time and they're loving it like, Honestly, it's just, it's it's a wonderful feeling. It really is. Shanty Hunters comes to Kickstarter on November the 2nd. There is a link in the show notes so that you can land on that project page and be there to learn more about the game and be able to play it real soon. If you want to know more about Tristan's blog, check MoltenSulfur.com. The Terrible Warriors will return on Tuesday with the seventh episode in our Simbaroom campaign, Thistlehold is under attack, but among our trio will rise an unlikely competent combat character? Are we still playing the same game? If you don't want to wait until Tuesday, you can listen to that episode right now on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash terriblewarriors. And even if you don't support us on Patreon and you just follow the page, there is a public post that you can listen to right now that bridges the gap between episodes five and six. If you've been listening to our Symbrome story, you know that we just did a time jump by about six months from the end of episode five when we left the Titan Mountains behind to the beginning of episode six when we are already established in Thistlehold. What happened during that lost time? Well, we did a little workshopping and we recorded our entire conversation as we added experience points to our characters, talked a little bit about the game. It's a lot of table talk, but if that's the kind of behind the scenes you're interested in, it's available to listen to for free on our Patreon page. You just got to go there, click follow, and you can listen to it right now. Stay up to date with all of the things that are happening here on this show, including what game we're going to be recording next as we get into November. That game's not going to come out to January, but we're recording it in November. We'll be announcing all that very soon. That's on Twitter at Dice Warriors. And of course, all of our interviews with Meet the Makers and all of our behind the screens and our previous games with Spire and our entire back catalog of 
nine years of podcasting history is all available at terriblewarriors.com, available forever for free for you. We have new episodes for you every Tuesday with the stories, every Thursday with the talking. This show is edited by me, Justin Eacock, and that really cool music you're hearing in the background for the very first time, that is custom music made just for the Terrible Warriors by Epic Game Music. See you back here on Tuesday for the next episode in Simba Room. Enjoy your weekend. And until that time when we're sitting around that table again, rolling dice again, and sharing stories together, and maybe even singing a song. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for being a terrible warrior. Be good to each other. <laughs>